Agile India 2017 is Asia's largest and premier conference on Agile and Lean methods. This year's conference will take place in Bangalore starting on Monday, March 6th, where experts and practitioners from around the world will share their experience. For more information, please visit our website, 2017.agileindia.org. Our guest today is Evan Laybourne. Evan is an executive consultant at IBM based out of Singapore. He has over 10 years of business leadership experience specializing in agile business management. He is the author of Directing the Agile Organization, a lean approach to business management, and speaks regularly at both local and international uh, conferences. Evan, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. So uh, it's good to see you again, Evan. I, we've met up with you at uh, a previous Agile India conferences, and always good to see you in your three-piece suit. I think I've now been to five Agile India conferences, and uh, uh, always with the three-piece suit, and uh, always having lots of fun. So you do have the opportunity to, to go around the world and see these different conferences uh, and different different Agile communities. Is there anything that stands out about the the state of Agile and the Agile community in, in India? Oh, I think I've been lucky to see the, the growth of the community. Five years ago, I would have described it as immature. There were pockets of... Uh, excellence. There are pockets of uh, organizations really being agile, uh, but the vast majority were were just either getting started or hadn't gone beyond the basics, hadn't gone beyond shoe, hadn't gone beyond doing agile. I think over the last five years, we're seeing more and more organizations really uh, start to adopt the agile mindset, the mentality, and increase in their ability and their capability. Um, to be agile, and so it's it's over the last five years seeing that growth has been very interesting, especially compared to others and uh, uh, a lot of the other countries where uh, and I don't mean America obviously, but uh, uh, a lot of the other countries are still sitting in a very immature state. What would you just? What would you say is a, the catalyst? I, th I think that's really interesting how you say they've, uh, you've got a community that's a very vibrant, growing community, but they've made that transition from just you know doing agile into really internalizing it and, and the mindset and and adopting the mindset. Is there certain catalysts that enabled that, and can other communities try and time and success? Time and success. It, it's. If Agile uh, and Agile delivery, and we are talking technical Agile here or, or Agile in software, um, if it wasn't successful, then companies would abandon it. Um, but with a little bit of success, there's an, an impetus, there's, a, there's momentum to continue to improve. And uh, a, lot, a lot of what I talk about falls under the domain of sort of business agility. And I talk about how um, organizations there's a theory of agile constraints. An organization can only be as agile as its least agile part. And in many cases, that's not IT. But with time and success, organizations realize this. And so they start to emerge, or business agility starts to emerge within different organizations. And they, when they're going and they're looking at how they can improve, they start to realize that being agile is where they need to go, where they need to improve, whereas the uh, the baseline of doing Agile, that's been done. They've succeeded at that. And so, um, of course, a lot of organizations don't improve beyond that point, but many more do. I find that interesting because, you know, I think a, a first step probably when people think about business agility is just agility outside of IT, but you're talking about it going a step further into changing, like it's it's a fundamental shift in the way the business is is run, and you can't just have little pockets of agility, but the whole business itself has to function differently. Is that is that what you've seen? Yes, absolutely. And um, companies in India are starting to uh, come to that conclusion um, in 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 many ways, in the same way that companies in other countries in in America and in Australia have been coming to that conclusion. It's if if an organization can't think in an agile way, then 
you are fundamentally constrained in your agileness, your ability to uh, adapt to market changes, your ability to innovate, because it, it's take the budgeting process as an example. Um, if you're being agile with an 18 month uh, monolithic budget that is uh, pre selecting specific projects to be done, then uh, whilst those projects may be agile and you may use Scrum for that, you're not going to be able to actually capitalize on momentum and movements in the markets, in the economy, uh, within your clients. So I'm seeing a lot of organizations in India start to realize that, yes, agility in technology is one part of it, but it's got to go well beyond. So how do you how do you tackle that problem? How do you bring whole scale business agility? Businesses are complex systems. It's very difficult to go in and try and have a impact in one specific area uh, when there's actually a, a number of different things that happen have to happen simultaneously. So what do you do about what do you do about that? Oh, there's no single answer. I wish there were. It'd make my life are much easier. Um, and in many regards, we've already solved this problem. Every time a large organization's IT division goes agile, they are thinking about a complex adaptive system. They're thinking about the interfaces and integration of multiple teams. Um, scaling that across an organization requires nuance. It requires understanding how finance works and how HR works. And it requires understanding the, the integration and interfaces between different divisions. But at the same time, that, that, uh, that transformational activity is, can be self-directed. Organizations and given the right catalyst can actually move in that direction by themselves. Others will bring in coaches and transformational consultants. Others will um, do it slowly, piecemeal, where they'll they'll pick agile outside IT. They'll do agile marketing next, and once they get a few more successes, once again the equation of time plus success, and we start to see a little a sort of a more organic growth. So there's no one size fits all solution. It depends on the appetite of change for the organisation, the cultural aspects of that organization and whether agile is part of their operating DNA or whether agile is something that is foreign to them that they're trying to learn. We, I, I hear a lot of, uh, you know, interesting metaphors like, like, you know, their DNA and, and Steve Denning talks about agile being a mindset, but these are kind of a, a transient, uh, hard to, you can't hold these things in your hand. You can't just go and, and purchase Agile Mindset off the shelf. Uh, so how does a company get there? How do, we get for, how do we get from A to B? Well, okay, metaphor and, uh, and, and stories help conceptualize a complex problem. So DNA and, uh, and, and uh, uh, buying the mindset off the shelf, it, it, it helps us conceptualize something that's highly complex. And, and impossible to sort of grok, impossible to hold in our head. And it gives us the ability to think we understand it. Now, um, as an organization, it is, we have to go beyond the metaphor. Right? It's a good starting place because it gives us something that we talk about operating DNA. Say, so, ah, I know what that means. No, you don't. All right? You have an idea what an operating DNA might mean, but in your organization, it is, uh, there are thousands of employees. There are tens of thousands of moving parts. It, it's when, when someone says an exact, like the sum is greater, sorry, the sum is greater than the parts of its whole, right? So one plus one equals three. In an organization, one plus one plus one plus times a thousand equals not 1,000, equals 100,000, a million. Right? The number of connections and moving parts in an organization are so complex, so dynamic that these metaphors help us conceptualize it, but we need to understand that the organization is not the metaphor. And that's what that's actually the problem that has happened in the project management space, for example. We create this operating metaphor of a project. We create this metaphor of a, of a simple, single process. 
and we use that, we apply that, we cook it every single time, we apply the same pattern, the same metaphor, and that assumes that the work is the same. Now, if I'm building a bridge after a bridge after a bridge, I can use a very similar pattern. But in most of the work that we're doing, not in the knowledge workspace, applying those patterns, applying those metaphors, um, without understanding the fundamental complexity and the nuance in the work that we do, starts to break down. Now, not every single human can hold that in the head. And this is, this is where agile organizations thrive, because if I have an organization where the leadership is not in the single CEO, but is divested into the organization, where individuals and teams take ownership and accountability for their work. As a CEO, I don't need to understand how 100,000 people or 1,000 people, 100,000 connections, I don't need to understand what they're doing. I just need to know that they're pointed in the right direction. The teams, the individuals, they take ownership and accountability of their work. They can decide what is the best way of working for them. And so we, we can move away from these platitudes of, uh, uh, and simplifications and actually go, you, your team, self-organizing, maybe even self-managing, if you want to go that far, uh, but at least self-organizing, your team of 10, 15 people, five people, you know what you need to do, right? You know the connections, you know the nuance, you know the complexity. Do it. You have an outcome that you need to achieve, right? You, need to, you know the upstream and downstream teams that you need to connect with. You don't need to know what that team three countries away is, is, is doing because it has negligible impact on you, no more so than a separate company in some cases. And so we have this separation and it allows individuals to take because they know the details, they can be very deep. And the CEO and the CIO and the, C and the CFO who, who sit at the top don't need to know what everyone's doing in a very specific sense. They just need to know that there's a, a common direction and some, and some common principles and governance around that. So you, made, you mentioned something really interesting there. You, you mentioned that we take this concept of a project and it's really a, a metaphor and that we, we reapply it over and over. And when it might not necessarily be the best place to do so, there might actually be other methods of working. And this is a lot of where your work has come in with the, the no projects and the no project space, which to me, and, and feel free to correct me, my, my, explanation would be is you know it where my where mindset before has been let's projectize work uh and find work and build projects around it let's let's take that on its head and take what traditionally we would think of as these projects and operationalize them and and find ways to just make them as part of the day-to-day -day operations of our of our, our our companies and 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 move away from trying to just turn everything to a project is that is that a decent description of no projects I describe it as the alignment of activities to outcomes measured by value and constrained by working principles. Um, and for me, that description sort of encapsulates the three elements, right? Value, activity, outcomes. We do work an activity that creates value and that value improves a business outcome. Now that seems, once again, it's a, it, it, it's a metaphor, it's something very, very simple. Um, but a project is a temporary endeavor to create a product, service, or result. That's the definition. So if we can structure our work so that it's not, not temporary, because our work isn't temporary anymore. All right? If I'm building a bridge right, from to, to cross a, a river, when that bridge is complete, right, I can't add more features. There's no upgrade to that bridge. I can maintain the bridge, and I need to maintain the bridge. Otherwise, the value that has been created will degrade. But the maximum value, once that span is complete and the bridge is painted, the maximum value of that bridge has been created. It is realized every single time someone walks over the bridge. Uh, or a car drives over the bridge, but I can't add features. Someone can't come up with an idea of, oh, hey, how about we do something else? I can, like, okay, it's a metaphor, so yes, we could build a second bridge and whatever else, but realistically, as a metaphor, it, it works fairly well. The work that we do is not the same. 
IT, marketing, HR, finance. There is no doneness of value. We can add more features. We can add more capability. We can improve the value of the product. And if we have a structure that has a continuous improvement of value rather than a temporary stop-start concept, that continuous improvement of value is going to, well, increase the, the, the outcome that we achieve. Now, if we align that with things like um, in agile, inspect and adapt, so we're continuously looking at the work that we do and going, is the work that we're doing continuously adding value? And there isn't, there, there's a natural end of life of a product. Right? Um, that uh, software or marketing campaign is going to naturally end at a particular point. But when we talk about the duration and scale of a project versus a product, they are orders of magnitude different. I, I was thinking about this, this concept of a business outcome, and I, I think there's a lot of the outcomes we think of are more or less become proxies for profit. But... I think you're talking about something different than that, different than just focusing on, on uh, quarterly results and, and shareholder value and that kind of thing. Um, so can you walk us, yeah, walk us through a bit more what you mean. There, there's a great quote right. by Frederick Laloux um, uh, in his book, uh, and I'll paraphrase. Um, profit is like air. We need to breathe in order to live, but we don't live to breathe. And, and that's, I think, quite insightful. As an organization, we need to make profit. We need to survive. We need to be able to pay our bills, pay our staff, and we need to have enough money in the bank, enough capacity to survive the trials and tribulations of business. So when business goes down, all right, we don't have to start laying off staff all the time. Um, that there's enough money in the bank. Now, so that means that profit is important, but no, perhaps except for, 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 for banks, no organization, they go into business and their business is profit. Their business is manufacturing something. Their business is creating a service or a product, mowing lawns or creating software or building bridges. These businesses are, have a rationale, something that they want to do, um, something that is their expertise, their passion. Right? And these are the outcomes we're talking about. Yes, everything needs to make a profit, but that is not what we do. It is just what we need in order to survive. Does that make sense? <laughs> It, it does, and I, I think if a part of what you're saying about differentiating between value and, and business outcome is, is the value is, is being created by the, the actions that we take, and building a bridge is creating value, but we need to understand how is that connected to some ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve, which has all sorts of overlaps with leadership concepts and, and changing the way we lead. and. Outcomes are very hard. So in the last Agile India, I gave a talk called, um, if you need to start a project, you've already failed. And in that, I described what we call an outcome profile, which is a, uh, it, it's a very simple model to define a business outcome. So what is the outcome? What is the measure? What are the targets? What's the baseline? Who owns it? What are the dependencies? Um, and it allows organizations to think about outcomes uh, at an organizational level rather than focus on the thing that is being done. And too often organizations, when they, when they start, actually, let me take a step back. I, I, used to be a project ma I used to be a project manager. I used to write business cases. And in every at project business case, there's a section on benefits. And benefits are wonderful things. And, and your finance division is going to give you money for your project based on the business benefits that you say that your project is going to um, create. Now, there's two problems with this. Number one, well, actually there's three problems. N number one, the business, the money for that project was allocated 12 months ago in the annual planning cycle. They're going to give you the money, you just need to convince them that they should. Right? And But well, they've already made the decision, so the bar to actually convince them is very low. Number two, 
in a project definition, the a project is meant to do something, but the actual realization of those benefits is not the responsibility of the project, which means I can get away with anything. I can say this project will save $20 million. To hollers. I can deliver on time, on budget, and um, on scope. I can deliver a successful project and yet completely fail at delivering the business the business benefits. And yet I'm still successful because as a project manager, I have achieved what it was that was defined for me. The organization has failed, but I have succeeded. So there's a dichotomy there. The third thing is actually about the benefits themselves. Because of because the bar is so low and because we already know what we want to do, we invent these benefits to try and justify doing what we want to do. And so what happens is we, we go, all right, this application will save two minutes per person per day. So therefore, that's $2 million a year in productivity. Say, no, it's not. All right? like, no organization can realize two minutes per person per day. All right, that is not actually a, a reasonable benefit that can be achieved. Um, likewise, as I, uh, sometimes the, be the, be the benefits are very clear. We can decommission something, but more often than not, they're just a, a, a line on a piece of paper that never gets actually tracked or never gets realized. All right? The alternative is to actually put it around. Don't start with the what you want to do. All right? Don't start with an idea of, hey, we should upgrade this system and it's going to have these benefits. Go, we need to achieve these business outcomes. All right? I'm going to fund a team all right, a certain amount of money to achieve these business outcomes. I personally don't care how they do it. Or more accurately, I don't care what they do in order to achieve those outcomes. As long as they comply with certain principles, all right, they don't break the law, they, they play nice with the other teams, they collaborate. Whatever principles we as an organization hold dear constrain a team's ability to do anything. But within those principles, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to say that every month we're going to inspect and adapt. We're going to say if the business outcome is to improve staff, um, uh, improve staff uh, satisfaction. We want happy staff. Right? That's this team. Happy staff is worth to us a million dollars a year, right? Because of attrition rates and retraining and whatever else. So I'm going to pay five hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars to this team, right? That's what it's worth to me in order to achieve happy staff. In that hundred thousand dollars, you've got to pay the salary of the, of the team members. There's some level of, of funds of available to do something else. Right? If they need to hire somebody else, or they need to make decisions or buy products or whatever else. But if it's worth a hundred, if it's worth a million, I'm not going to spend a, a, a million because I could be wrong. Right? But I think it's worth a million. I'm going to spend ten to twenty to thirty percent of that. That team is going to, every month, we're going to look at the attrition rates, the employee satisfaction surveys, whatever measure we put against staff satisfaction. And that team is going to inspect and adapt. The work that we've done has created value. That value has had a meaningful impact to the outcome, or not. If not, then we're doing the wrong work. So let's take a moment to collect pivot. All right, and find what else could we do in order to achieve the business outcome that we're trying to achieve. No project, no temporary endeavor, no product first, but building teams around outcomes and the business results. Uh, so I, I've been a product. So I've been a project manager as well. I've done the whole project manager body of knowledge thing, and 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 it, I understand the appeal of, of having well-defined uh, parameters for what needs to be accomplished. You've got scope, time, cost, and you can build plans and track against those uh, track against those plans. I, I like what you're saying. At, at the end of the day, those are just proxy variables, right? It, we, you know, we, we, we're, they're starting out with the assumption that if we're on time and if we're on, if we hit the requirements and we are um, within the budget, then therefore we'll be successful. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, what I think maybe that because you can actually achieve the you can achieve those three things and not necessarily achieve the business outcome. 
What's potentially challenging, I see, though, is for people, potentially high up people in the, in the company to to have the hubris to admit that their decisions of what they're planning to fund and and what they're planning to invest in aren't necessarily correct, aren't necessarily going to achieve the business outcomes they want. It's just, well, clearly, if, if I've made this decision, this is worthwhile, um, here's the time, budget, and uh, scope, and if you hit that, then, you know, therefore, uh, the business objectives will be achieved. But that's not the case. So how do you, how do you shift the mindset of, of having the sense of fallibility of... Like we have to get away from this great man theory that, yeah, that people the feel like theory. they need to show that their own brilliance in an idea, right? And admit that our ideas could be bad and we need to inspect and adapt. Like there's a political or a, 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 sh a major shift in the thinking of people. Yeah, because to a certain degree it admits or it's forcing me to open up the possibility I could be wrong about my decision, right? Um, I might not get the, the business outcomes I'm, I'm looking for. So what, what's your take on that, Evan? I suppose there's two things. One, we're changing, we're fundamentally changing the operating metaphor. So where the operating metaphor is a project, time, cost, and scope are our measures. That's what's important to us because we're not, to be honest, we're not funding a benefit. We're not funding an outcome. We're funding a piece of work in the assumption, in the assumption that it will achieve a benefit. And so the measure of that benefit, the measure of that outcome happens very late and usually too late to be effective. Now, agile delivery is helpful in this regard because agile delivery allows um, an organization to um, incrementally deliver a product. Now, the question here is, is the product the right thing to do in the first place? And as you say, it's very hard to have an organization or a senior leader in an organization admit that they were wrong, that it was the wrong product, because um, people's uh, self-worth, self-identity, as well as actual tangible worth um, and their employment are often based on making these right decisions. And so we incentivize appearing right over being right, and, and that's just human nature. So what we do is we just change the entire equation rather than having time, cost, scope as a constraint. All right? And obviously, time, cost, uh, or, or cost is always a constraint. It's always something that we have a limited, a finite supply of, as with time. But we move that and we go, this is one constraint. Our team, we're going to fund a team continuously, six people, $100,000 a year, all right? for, for the rest of eternity, or at least until such time as the outcome that this team is accountable for um, is no longer meaningful. And so it stops being a matter of leaders making the wrong decision. We're not, and, and when we're transitioning to this kind of model, it's not about you've made a wrong decision. It's about we're going to change the way that you work at a very fundamental level. So we're not just changing, we're not, we're not saying you're doing the wrong thing, we're not saying you're doing it in the wrong way. We're just saying that we're going to be outcome first, not project first. And w once you change where you start from, there's a cascading effect of everything else that, f that follows behind. Now, obviously, uh, we have to have the right people, and this goes back to my um, constraining factors. If IT wants to do this, but finance is not on board, then we're going to have trouble because we're going to then, finance is going to want their uh, their projects and their project plans. And so IT is going to have this push and pull of uh, we want to do it this way, finance wants to do it this way. So we'll try and wrap no projects inside a project. Or we're going to try and wrap agile inside a waterfall project management plan. The same sort of dichotomies always occur. Right? So we still need to make sure that there is a which constraining factor is most constraining right now and what can we do about it? And if it's finance, then we need to change the way the finance is thinking. But as far as the leadership is concerned, right, we, if they recognize there's a problem, we can give them a way of changing without losing face. 
If they don't recognize there's a problem, but other people around them do, once again, we can give them a mechanism to, uh, to push improvement without making someone else a failure. And we do want to, to, we, we want to make it safe to fail, but a $10 million project is by definition not safe to fail. You might fail a sprint, you might fail a feature, but you can't fail the project. So we do make it safe to fail by there is no project. There is a funding stream, there is a value stream, there is a, a flow of work, and you could fail any given point of work. And because we're always inspecting, adapting, not against a product, not against uh, a set of requirements, but against a business outcome, we have that ability to adapt to the business outcome. Agile in IT is, is a fairly mature concept, and is... Is this still something that we're trying to figure out in the rest of the organization, or are there companies that have are excelling at this and, and are leading the way? Oh, there are definitely companies which are excelling at this. Um, and uh, you might use the term no projects, but a lot of these concepts have been, uh, are being used in other terminologies and other domains and have been for, for, for a decade or two. Um, there are elements of this, this sort of value stream funding model coming out of beyond budgeting. Um, the concepts of holacracy and self-management um, and teal organizations, which have been around for 10 plus years, are uh, look at the elements of uh, teaming and the elements of uh, accountability um, to outcome rather than to output. So a lot of these in fact, in fact, I would say all of these elements have been proven in different industries, in different countries, in 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 different organisations. And 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 it's sad to say, but there's almost nothing new under the sun. Uh, we have so many. We have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organisations around the world who are being agile at an organizational level. They might call it business agility, they might call it no projects, they might call it something else entirely. Um, they may not even know what it is, but it's just how they work. And so these organizations are constantly pushing the bounds of uh, operating models for organizations. And startups, lean startups, another case in that. What we're trying to do, I think, is at this point in time, at this juncture in history, we have so many different and distinct ideas about business agility that I think we're now starting to get a consolidation. We're starting to get these ideas start to come together, look at each other and go, oh, that's a good idea and this is a good idea. And I'll start to take some of them and sort of bring them together. So we're never going to get one definition of business agility, but we are going to see in the same way in the Agile Wars back 20 years ago, we will see a consolidation of Agile frameworks into a couple of major ones um, that when people think Agile, that's what they think. I think we'll see the same emerge in the next five to 10 years around business agility, where there will be a couple of business agility processes and practices and frameworks that will come together. And when people think business agility, they'll think about those. Is that a desirable thing? Um, and I'll go back to the, I, I suppose what really resonated to myself when I, when I first got introduced to Agile and Agile ideas, it was this, uh, coming from the project management background, it was this democratization, this, uh, this idea that the way we work is not necessarily the realm of, uh, of experts and ivory tower methodologists, but but this is something that is tangible, we can understand, and we can, it's not a solved problem. We can innovate on this daily as part of doing our jobs. And that was a very powerful message for me personally. Is that, does it, does this coalescing? Okay, go ahead. There's, there's three sides to this. There is, in the first instance, there is the implementation of an idea. And the implementation of business agility in every organization is going to be unique, no matter how much consolidation occurs. The implementation of Scrum in every organization is unique. The, like, if Scrum was the answer, we would never have a retrospective. We would never need to improve because what would we change? Right? The whole point of Agile and retrospectives and continuous improvements and Kaizen is such that we recognize that 
the team and the implementation of agility is something that we work at week by week, iteration by iteration. So uh, whilst when you think about agile, most people will start by thinking scrum, right? The implementation is unique. Second point, when, when you're selling an idea to somebody who isn't in the community, right, someone from the outside who you want to bring into the community, when you're selling the idea of, of Agile, you don't start by giving them the 100,000 options which are available to them. You say, go read the Scrum Guide or go read the Wikipedia page on, on Agile um, or have a look at the, uh, at the book on Kanban. We don't give them every option. We give them narrow it down and say, this is the synthesis of what it means to be agile. By the way, as you get more mature, right, there are a lot more options open to you. But if I'm talking to a, to, to a CEO or a CIO of an organization and saying you should consider adopting an agile approach and they go, can you describe agile to me or how, or how we would do that? I don't describe agility in all its forms. I will generally start with Scrum or Kanban because it is accessible. It gives them something to anchor onto so that when they talk to their peers and their colleagues, when they look online, there's a common thread in what is being said. And so part of agile success is the success of the consolidation of agility into a few very clear, effective ways of working. Now, not everyone likes Scrum, not everyone likes Kanban, then that's fine. We have, we have alternatives. but you cannot deny the, 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 the success of Agile and its proliferation of organizations all around the world adopting Agile mindsets and Agile ways of working is in large part because of this consolidation. And my third point um, is once you've sold an idea, an organization matures, it goes Shu Ha Ri, if you understand that model. And mm -hmm. yep. at the level of Shu, at the, at the, when you're beginning, you need something tangible. You need something that is simple and that consolidation gives you that. We don't have to give you a menu. Like when you walk into a restaurant and you have 10,000 choices, how long does it take you to pick what you want? If you walk into a restaurant and you get three choices, it's easy to pick the one that you're, go you're going to have. It, it, it's the... Uh, it's a, uh, there's a name for it, some sort of choice theory. I've got a, I've got a simple solution to this problem. I just order whatever Chris is ordering. <laughs> it means that's, that I, that's Sean's theory of decision making. He only has so many decisions he's allowed to make in a, in a given lifetime. So I'm going to spend my decision making wisely. Yeah, there's, there's a, let, have you heard the story about, was, let me take you to the Philippines and I'll order for you and you will regret making that decision. Well, <laughs> well, well as, as you know, Evan, everything is context dependent. <laughs> no, when we're in India, we're going to be, we're going to go to a Filipino restaurant in India. Evan's going to be ordering. <laughs> so I've been in restaurants in India. Anyway, sorry. Um, but, the, but the third point, once you get to the level of re, or at least once you get to a level of maturity in your organization, you are fully able to, um, move away from that consolidation and pick, right? And so agile organizations who, who are mature, they will pick any combination of XP, FTD, TDD, DSDM, whatever you want, they'll go, oh, we'll take a bit from here and a bit from here because they have the maturity to know the goal is agility, not agile. And likewise, in the business agility context, as organizations become more mature, they're gonna have the ability to pick because they know what is important rather than the method itself. But when you're starting out, that's very hard to do. Yeah, and it, it, when, if you go back though to what you were saying about it needing to be in the DNA, and, and I think that's, that's, the, that's re, you, you've, you've injected this, the principles and mindset into the way you think and the way you work. Um, of course, we've seen organizations just, I guess, adopt Scrum into their work you know, the Agile coach comes in, they, they come in a two-day session, here's how you do Scrum, you're a Scrum master, now you're a product owner, and then they leave, and then there's no deeper evolution of the ideas. Uh, and is there, is there that risk, I, I guess, still? Do we, how, how, do we, how do we fundamentally change 
the DNA of organizations beyond just uh, putting a new process in place. Does, now, now, what I'm wondering is, does the Shuha remodel, which, I mean, if we're using the metaphor, let's, let's appreciate where the metaphor came from, from martial arts, right? So it's, and it, it's a person on a personal journey of mastery over a craft. Um, and I, I wonder how applicable it is at an organization. Can you can you look at a, as a whole organization as in a state of shuhari when really you've got a collection of individuals at different levels and it's it's shifting over time and they're all on their own personal journeys. Uh, is that a, a, a effective model for describing an organization? Does it apply? It's highly simplistic, and organizations. Uh, it's hard to measure an entire organization because uh, there may be divisions which are shu and divisions which are re there may be uh, cultural barriers and so forth but it, as a simplistic model it's a good simplistic model because it, it gives you not only a, a sense of where you are but a sense of where you can go and when we talk about maturity it's such a general term that it, it could mean anything um, but, and, but it could mean anything, but individuals in an organization will, it's something to be striven for, it's something to aim for. And so as a model, it gives you today and potentially the future. Um, is it the right model? Maybe. Is it the only model? Definitely not. But it's a simple metaphor to describe a path an organization takes. However, uh, having said that, there is a... There is a journey that organizations and teams within organizations do go on. However you describe that journey, right? Um, it, it does follow a path of I need to learn to I'm going to be, doing versus being. And when organizations don't think of it as a journey, they think of it as a step where they go, we're going to bring the, 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 the training company in, they're going to give us two days, we're all going to be certified Scrum Masters because that's all it takes to become a master. Sorry, cynicism, apologies. Um, I'll have my two-day course, I'll have my certification, we're agile, full stop, done. Now, that's not a journey, that's a single step. And organizations that don't think beyond that single step, they're the ones who are going to fail because, once again, uh, it doesn't matter how agile one person is, or in fact even one team is, if the organization is not on that path, you're always going to find yourself constrained. And people talk about bimodal IT. Right? Now, I think bimodal IT, and this is my personal opinion, is the biggest cop-out ever. Right? Bimodal IT is an organization saying, we do not have the guts or the ability to be agile. All right, so we're gonna have an agile part, which is the easy agile part, the digital team, let's say, and we're gonna have the non-agile part, the hard part, the bit that we're going to struggle to be agile, but we're not gonna even try. We're just gonna, we're gonna call it, we're gonna give it a name, bimodal IT or two-speed IT, and these guys can be as waterfall as they like. Now, we've done agile in mainframe, We've done Agile in infrastructure. We've done Agile in every single traditional waterfall space, right? And successfully, right? It comes down to Agile works where there is ambiguity and where there is a level of uncertainty and chaos, right? You go down a waterfall path if something is highly predictable. If you know with a high degree of certainty that what you plan and what you execute will not change. But the minute you have users involved, the minute you have customers involved, something is going to change. Right? It's very rare for that to be the case. So yeah. the sin of bimodal IT, or the curse of two-speed IT, is such that it makes it gives people an out. It allows them to give up halfway through this journey, right? which is why I really don't like the idea of two-speed IT. Putting that aside, right? These journeys that organizations are on, that is what's important. Whether you call it shuhari or whether you call it something else or whether you just have it as some sort of abstract continuous improvement, a retrospective, kaizen, slow continuous improvement. 
that is the journey that is important. Well, thanks, Evan. I, I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in India. I hope to hunt down a Filipino restaurant with you in India and, and force some uh, uh, Sean to experiment with some food. Well, I think the rule is that uh, whoever picks the food has to go first eating the food. Okay. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do you have anything coming up uh, that you want to talk about? Uh, so I suppose two, two things. I'll be doing two talks in... Um, uh, in Agile India, both on business agility, uh, one on the outcome profile that I described before, and one on just um, on, on, on business agility and how organizations can be more agile. There's also the business agility conference in New York that we are putting on. Uh, Chris, you are helping me with this, and many thanks for that. Um, that's going to be really exciting, which you can check out at businessagility2017.com. Um, and you can see the great lineup of speakers we have there as well. Yeah, it's excellent. I th I'm, I'm very interested to see how this uh, space of business agility continues to evolve and to see how these ideas uh, uh, diverge and converge. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the fast evolving space and the one that needs to. So I'm, I'm glad that these types of conferences, business agility conferences are, are coming up. You know, we, as, as you say, we need to start getting through these impedance mismatches and this is a whole of organization thing. So I'm glad we're having these conversations. Thanks for joining us today on the Agile India podcast. This video is produced by Chris and Sean Agile. You can find us on Twitter at Chris Sean Agile and our website www.chrisandseanagile.com. Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you next time.